So, a traditional Jewish, Christian, and Muslim. Feliz Navidad. <laughs> I want to wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas, everyone. <laughs> yeah, no more. <laughs> no, no more, more happy these, holidays. No more happy holidays. <laughs> <laughs> We're wishing you a Merry Christmas on this episode of the, the Holy, Holy Watermelon, Watermelon Podcast. Podcast. <laughs> But generally speaking, happy holidays is a superior term. <laughs> yes. But today we're going to talk specifically about the nativity. So Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. <laughs> uh, we're getting this out just in time so that if you've uh, pre-listened to it, you can share some of this episode with your family on Christmas Day as part of your Christmas observation, if that's a thing that your family does. <laughs> or just wow them with your knowledge. Right? <laughs> Maybe play it in the background while you're eating oh, Chinese food. Oh, I love food. that. Maybe I'll do that. So Christmas carols this year. Just the calming sound of my voice for my entire family. Just stand outside of strangers' <laughs> doors with a boombox <laughs> boom playing this like episode. Only watermelon. I love it. Everyone should everyone do that. More fun than Christmas caroling. I agree. <laughs> so <laughs> let's start with words i guess so so the word nativity as defined by miriam webster which we know preston doesn't like miriam webster it's the inferior english dictionary yeah it <laughs> defines nativity as the process or circumstances of circumstance of being born a horoscope at or of the time of one's birth or the place of your origin specifically it refers to the birth of jesus i have never heard it used in any other context but i've heard a couple of times in, I guess, a more literary context, when people are trying to sound a little more fran- fancy, they'll say, the land of my nativity. But most people don't talk Colloquially, like that. <laughs> nobody says that. Um. Saskatchewan is the land of my nativity oh, kind wow. of business. But, I'm yeah, so sorry. <laughs> that's the way it goes. Like Mewtwo says, it doesn't matter the circumstances of your birth. <laughs> no. The earliest so so we'll take that word and we'll talk about the earliest celebration of Christmas is um recorded as 336 CE. Yeah, the the Catholic, well, the the universal-ish Christian church at the time didn't really have it as a congregational celebration until then. Uh but it they did decide to drop it basically where it is today a week before the 1st of January. I don't know how they made that decision, but that's what they did. And we'll get into a little later how Jesus was definitely not born on December 25th, but yeah. <laughs> uh, they just kind of, I, it's not um, arbitrary. They didn't arbitrarily pick the day, but they absolutely picked the day that Christmas would be celebrated. Yes. On, so we'll get into that. Well, I mean, they, they could have picked any time in that week and for that goal, how they picked the 25th. Who knows? And they like the sound of the five. Maybe. Maybe that's half the trick right there. <laughs> <laughs> so 336 CE is when we have the first recorded congregational celebration of Christmas. Uh, they didn't actually celebrate it in the Christian church in Rome until s- about the end of the third century. So just shortly before that time. But it wasn't until about 40 years after that, in 379, when they had the first congregational Christmas feast in Constantinople. So this kind of spread kind of slowly, considering it was a fairly organized church at this time. Yeah. And and even we'll get into some other dates that are quite recent for a religion as old as Christianity, mm-hmm. for, for things that are celebrated um, but let's quickly chat about there are some Christian groups that don't celebrate Christmas. What? Uh, yeah, we talked about this a little bit last year that groups like Jehovah's Witnesses and Christadelphians and a, a few other, I guess, call them fringe groups because they don't fit into the big categories of uh, Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant. Well, and some of these groups don't even consider themselves Christian, which I disagree with, but and, they're well, self-identifying, so... I can't and argue a with lot them. of them are told by other Christians, you're not Christian. True. 
which of course is a frustrating bit of the way people deal with each other. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, But yeah, there's a good handful that don't celebrate Christmas. And I think it's worth noting that a good handful of the early Catholic Church fathers, like Origen, condemned the practice of celebrating birthdays and also did not celebrate Christmas because because it's it's a birthday kind of deal. Poor Jesus. (laughs) Doesn't get his birthday celebrated. Oh, well, yeah, it's... It's kind of weird. Remember we talked about this last year that birthday celebrations was very much a pagan thing. Mm -hmm. Pagan being a pejorative for anybody who's not Christian or Jewish. Right. (laughs) And so it was just a thing that the faithful worshippers of the God of Abraham just didn't do birthdays. Because it was celebration of other gods. And that just wasn't cool. So that's where we're at. (laughs) Getting into the story a little bit more, the the nativity is described in the Gospels of Luke and Matthew, which I'll let you handle most of that as our <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> resident theologian. But I found it really interesting that all records of Jesus's birth place it in Bethlehem, including Islam. So mm-hmm. a big misconception, I think we've talked about this a little bit, is that Muslims somehow don't believe in Jesus or whatever. But they do. They love Jesus <laughs> a lot. as a prophet, and they do have like his origin story in in their writings as well. Yeah. Interestingly enough, the Quran is also interested in the figure of Mary as well. So it's not just Jesus. That's where the <clears throat> excuse me, that's where the very common you see it a lot South Asian Muslims with daughters named Miriam. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, uh, it's interesting though. Even though we don't have any records saying anything other than Jesus was born in Bethlehem, there's a good handful of scholars now who are starting to think that maybe Jesus was born in Nazareth. Interesting. I I still can't get on board with it, but there's a couple of scholars who argue it. So if you're interested in reading up on that, go for it. Now, they also never really tell us his birth date. Nope. <laughs> um, most people believe that the date of the 25th is them christianizing a pagan holiday um i think it would be what you will yeah uh that would that falls around there or there's obviously the solstice Mm -hmm. as well right around this time there's also i have notes on this later i don't know where they are but it's also aligns with the zoroastrian holiday as well yeah if you're one of those people who thinks that christian christmas is deliberately a strike against hanukkah No, (laughs) that's not true at all. It's basically just a coincidence. It's definitely a lot more of a strike against the pagans. So December 25th is the solstice on the old Roman calendar. So celebrating the birth of the light of the world does fit pretty nicely into this time when the days start getting longer again. And there's also a lot of other festivals of light. So many. As right. I'm so, sure you've noticed if you've been listening to the show for the episode, last couple So weeks. it goes back to that metaphor of the darkest time of the year and then the light arrives. Exactly. So, which is a really nice metaphor, obviously, yeah. because every religion has borrowed it <laughs> at this point. But um, now the actual date, I remember this was years ago. I was listening to some documentary and... They were sort of saying that they, the, whatever, the scholars that were talking were quite positive that Jesus's birthday was in April, not yeah. in December. And you've uh, brought up some really good points on passages in the Bible that kind of point it to a more temperate time of year. Yeah. The shepherds being out in the fields with their flocks rather than keeping them sheltered in the cold, rainy winter. I mean, it's it's not like a Canadian winter, but it's still cold and rainy and and gross. I guess there's parts of Canada that are like that. Not where we are. It's not where we are. Where we are, it's white and awful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that does lead more into a, a temperate time of year. And the idea that it was uh, a census that all the world must be taxed, as Luke describes in chapter 2, doesn't hold up against good historical scholarship scrutiny there's so far we haven't found any records of a huge census through the empire at this time 
And that doesn't mean there wasn't one, but because of the decent records that we have of the time, it means it's very likely there was not a census at this time. Well, as you say, censuses are literally meant for record keeping. And I I recognize that it's 2,000 years old, but we do have records older than that. Yeah. So it's probably not the case that there was a census like luke suggests well and even people debate the year uh, yeah. we've sort of put it at zero not that zero there's zero no year there's zero. no zero so i guess one, BC one and then one ad but or ce but scholars actually place the year even earlier than one yes whichever one you want to pick a lot of scholars will put jesus birthday somewhere between six and four bce some of them will go even earlier oh wow they're not the majority as far as i've been able to observe and very often anywhere between April 1st and September 30th. It's kind of a big window, good old six months there. <laughs> <laughs> the problem with having this early birth date for Jesus is that every single scholar who has said it has to be several years BCE is making a kind of embarrassing error, assuming that Herod the Great is still alive for the event. And it makes sense that that's coming into their calculations because Matthew says, of course, Herod was still alive until a little while after Jesus was born. But we're very certain that Herod was dead by 2 CE. So, tricky problems. (laughs) Uh, Unfortunately, Matthew's account isn't terribly reliable. Matthew chapter 2 follows kind of trope, I guess, of Jewish literature, where a great religious figure is persecuted at his birth by a notoriously evil ruler. We have this kind of thing going on with Moses and the Pharaoh in Egypt, and this trope gets repeated again with Abraham. The king they've picked for this story is good old King Nimrod, and this is actually used a fair bit through good old um, Judaic religious literature. It's kind of interesting, but it makes, and the more we find it, the more it makes it look like Matthew chapter 2 is just fiction. (laughs) Yeah. um, There's a few parts of both of these gospels where where we go, you just made this up. (laughs) The census being a big one. So I wanted to dive into that a little. Well, so Luke is quite separated from the, the story he's trying to tell. But he did gather information from a lot of sources. And he starts his story by saying, hey, I've compiled all these stories from all these different people to give you his his one intended reader, who would then spread it out, one story about Jesus from beginning to end kind of deal. Problem is, it looks like he didn't vet his sources very well. So the problem with the census is that it's asking Mary and Joseph to go back to their ancestral home, which is basically unheard of. Right? (laughs) So to, to put it in perspective, my family is historically from Ireland. That would be me having to go back to Ireland where I have never lived to participate in a census. In a census that doesn't count women. <laughs> so poor Mary was just thrown on a donkey because what? Joseph was a dick? What's rule number one of religion? Don't, Don't be, be a, a dick. dick. <laughs> yeah. So we've got some issues here. <laughs> so, yeah. There very likely was no census at the time. And if there was, this still doesn't explain why Joseph brought Mary to Bethlehem. It's a lot more likely that there was a religious festival where they would be expected to attend the temple, which is honestly just a couple hours walk from where Jesus was supposed to have been born in Bethlehem. So that makes perfect sense. Would this potentially be in, uh, linked with a festival or, or maybe just location of the temple, like a pre-birth ritual? And because they have those in Judaism, right? You're expected to... There's there's more ritual specifically prescribed for after the birth. Mm. And usually it's usually it is go to the temple and be circumcised, receive your name. And that is part of the story that's after the birth. And so that could have been the reason why they traveled to Bethlehem. 
to be at the temple for that. I don't actually know of any sources saying that that had to happen at the temple, though. Mm. So I I could just be missing a thing there. Yeah, I just, I mean, I'm thinking of, like, Mormons travel to go to the temple if you're not near a temple. Yeah. But that's more of an adult thing. Yeah, that's not a, (laughs) you're nine months pregnant, better get over here. Right. Waddle your way here on a donkey. Right. Actually, speaking of (laughs) Mormonism, there is a passage in the Book of Mormon that actually says that Jesus was born very, very, very shortly after the beginning of the year. Hmm. Which means that since the year in, in this calendar is starting at the spring equinox, that places this specific time at the Passover, hmm. which gives us a festival and a reason to be at Jerusalem at this time. Interesting. So... That does help back up the idea that a lot of scholars have that springtime is the time. <laughs> Fair. The, basically, the only people that argue that Luke must be right regarding the, cens- the census, excuse me, are fundamentalists who believe that the Bible is the unfallible word of God. Yeah. So. Which, I mean, if you've read the book, you know that God didn't write it. <laughs> I hope he'd write... Oh, I was just going to say something mean. I was going to say, I would hope God would write a way more exciting book. <laughs> <laughs> but this is me just coming off all the temple measurements, so... But, but I mean, yes, there are very dry bits there of the Bible. The but book. it's got war, it's got murder, it's got sex, it's got involuntary sex. <laughs> it's an Not exciting book. There's a different name for that. Uh, <laughs> I was tra- hoping to keep it a little more PG. Fuck. <laughs> Too late. Yes, the Bible has rape in it. It's a problem. Yep. And <laughs> if we're there already. So speaking of sex, you know who didn't have any sex? Mary. That's a weird, weird bit of the story. I thought you were going to say that was a weird segue. <laughs> <laughs> That's a perfectly reasonable segue, actually. Well done. Thank you. There's... A, this huge tradition built up that Mary could never, ever, ever have sex, no matter what, even after Jesus was born. And there's just no good I, theological oh, poor, reason for poor that. Poor Mary. <laughs> Come on. Right? She carried the Son of God. You can let her have some fun <laughs> afterwards. Well, Jesus has brothers and sisters. The Bible is very clear on that detail. Some versions, some translations of the text kind of fudge that away and clean it up so that it doesn't look like that's the case. That is a serious problem. And then there's a bunch of theologians that are like, no, no, they're the kids from Joseph's other marriage, which we've never been given any reason to believe that he actually had any other wives. Oh, well, there you go. Uh, I'm quoting this from Wikipedia on the virgin birth, honestly, because I think it's just great wording. <laughs> Jesus was conceived by his mother, Mary, through the power of the Holy Spirit and without sexual intercourse. And that's basically what we get from both Luke and Matthew, that she was undefiled until after the birth of Jesus. Because, you know, she kept the law. You're not supposed to have sex before you're married. (laughs) Uh, But that also is cited uh, when we talk about Jesus being both divine and human, which is an important pair of aspects of his identity. Yes. Uh, and, And back to the point about Islam earlier, the virgin birth is also mentioned in the Quran. So... Christianity had a pretty solid influence on the oh, the genesis of Islam. Absolutely. Now, there's also, and, and when I was, you know, first learning about religion in general, I thought these were the same thing. So there's the virgin birth and there's the immaculate conception. And they are two different things. They sure are. The immaculate conception is Mary's mother wasn't a virgin. Because the immaculate conception is about... The birth of Mary, her conception and birth. <laughs> yes, so Mary also doesn't have a father, biologically speaking. I mean, she Biologi- she's supposed to, but yeah, the story gets real weird. <laughs> so in an effort to make Mary more holy and further separate Jesus from this new idea of original sin, a story was devised that Mary was born to a woman named Anna, 
or Hannah, if you're keen on Old Testament characters, and her old sterile husband, Joachim. And he was supposed to be away for just long enough to let us know for sure that Hannah hadn't been having sex before Mary was born. It's all kind of weird, and it's it's testified of in a, a couple of the proto-gospels. There's the Gospel of Mary and the proto-gospel of James. And it's, it's a lot of work to come up with this idea that we have to separate Jesus further from this idea that doesn't actually make a whole lot of sense to begin with. I just truly believe that these women are running the two greatest scams of all time. <laughs> See, that would be easy to jump on board with if the story of Hannah was at all reliable. I'm pretty sure every bit of information that we have about Mary's family is fiction, written centuries after she died. Even naming her Anna as we have it in the the common tradition today, it is stealing the character of Hannah from the Old Testament who was barren, couldn't have a baby, went to the temple, prayed real hard, and then got her baby and gave her to the temple. That's exactly the story plagiarized almost word for word, it feels like. Oh, wow. For Mary. Oh. (laughs) Now, um, before we jump on to our next section, um, the word immaculate. (laughs) I, this is just like one fun fact I remember learning and have mm-hmm. never, and you're a words guy. So immaculate. So we talk about, oh, like your home is immaculate, mm-hmm. meaning like it's really clean and put together. Immaculate actually means untouched by a man. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're tell, <laughs> which just makes me giggle, your home is immaculate. Where did your husband go? <laughs> my house is immaculate when my husband's gone. In all senses of the word. (laughs) It is very clean when he's not around. (laughs) Uh, So, yeah, that's, uh, I think, we've kind of bastardized the term immaculate to mean, you know, pristine or perfect. But no, it means untouched by a man. So that's how you can remember the immaculate conception and... See, I've I've got this little problem now Uh where in my head it's not just he didn't touch it with his hand... Oh, wow. (laughs) And one can hope that this is the state of at least most of your home. Mm. (laughs) Oh, well. Cut. (laughs) Cut the tape, Brian. (laughs) Uh, Another interesting bit that shows up in Matthew chapter 2, and remember, I'm very convinced that this whole story of Matthew chapter 2 is fiction, is the Magi. The the three wise men, or kings in the English tradition for no good reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a very good chance that they were Zoroastrian priests, based on the words that we have, if these were real people that were really present for the story. <laughs> well, and, and just to jump ahead a bit, they actually never give a number in the Bible, so right. we have decided it was three because... Partially because of the three gifts. Yeah. Um, and we know three is an uh, important number in Christianity, but they never actually say that it's three. So you're right. <laughs> or assume it's three smart guys. <laughs> right. The, the story is, the story goes <laughs> that we got uh, three-ish fellas um, <laughs> that were from the East. So it would make sense that they were Zoroastrians from Persia. That, that does... If we're sticking Logically with the term, work. yeah, if yeah. we're sticking with the term Magi. And yeah. I also, this brings so much more meaning to the song, We Three Kings, of sure. Orient are. Right, because they're from they're, the East. They're from the East, yeah. Yeah. They're not even the far Orient, just Orient, Orient from, from there. From where they are. Which, of course, only means East. <laughs> <laughs> um, Zoroastrianism is pretty deep into astrology, and so it gets linked to the occult and magic. And Magi. so here are magicians. It fits in. The Greek text is pretty explicit. It does call them mages. And so not translating that as sorcerers feels weird. (laughs) Wise men is definitely downplaying the magic bit. (laughs) Yeah, we're deliberately shifting away from wizards. Yeah. 
Oh, and here's the point I made earlier. There is a major Zoroastrian holiday, Yalda, on December 21st. Um, so I was just really fascinated how these kind of all link together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, a curious thing. <laughs> and <laughs> so these magi are regulars in most representations of the nativity. If you don't have somebody bringing gifts, your set is... Incomplete. Woefully incomplete or historically accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, yeah, so these three wise men are said to have brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Murder! <laughs> Judith, no! <laughs> <laughs> Did you know, Preston, that the first visual depiction of a nativity scene was from 1223 by St. Francis of Assisi? Man. That was the first time we visualized this donkey and the three guys and a little baby in a manger. So that's less than 800 years ago. Yeah. That's pretty new relative to the Christian tradition. Yeah. It's kind of nifty. All right. Going back to these three gifts, the gold, frankincense, and myrrh. <laughs> uh, so these gifts are symbolic, as is the entirety of Matthew chapter 2. Gold is treasure for the king. Frankincense is burned in priestly ritual prayers. And myrrh is a decent painkiller representing the great healer that is Jesus. Uh, of course, all of these gifts are useful in real life. Anybody who's dropping babies in a barn clearly needs more gold. <laughs> dropping babies. I like that term. <laughs> uh, anything that covers that barn birth smell combo is definitely appreciated. For the frankincense, yep. Yeah. And painkillers? Great gift for any woman who's just given birth. So... This these birth, birthday gifts <laughs> do make some good sense. They're but, also very expensive, even now. Right? Yeah. All of these things are not cheap. We have much cheaper painkillers now that actually do the job better. <laughs> so Yay. development is good. Yay, science! <laughs> exactly. So it's it's interesting. The Gospel of Matthew is the only one that mentions them. Out of not just the four biblical gospels, but out of the larger collection of gospels, there's a couple other references to these that are obviously taken from Matthew's story. Hmm. And that's all we get. And we don't even have the volumes of these three gifts. It's just, here's, here's some gifts. a single tiny gold piece. Yeah. And it's for the narrative value of these symbols. Of course, from a story that isn't historically reliable. <laughs> Definitely meant to be more symbolic. All right. <gasps> Tell us a story, Preston. <laughs> All right. Let's get into the a reworking of Luke chapter 2 that uh, I can explain some more of the bits if they inspire questions after the story. I was going to say, yeah, I'll do it in full so people can play it at Christmas. Yes. All right. So this is drawn from Luke chapter 2. Miriam is a young Jewish girl living in the northern province. You know it as Galilee, which is just a generic designation, as lame as the Northwest Territories. Miriam has been engaged to ma marry this fella, Joseph, and he's a decent guy, not terribly old, no other wives, and he's honest to the point that it gets him in trouble sometimes. Things are tough when an engagement lasts a whole year, particularly when sex is forbidden until after the official marriage ceremony. Miriam and Joseph are separately visited by heavenly messengers who tell them that Miriam's going to have a baby boy. Joseph is warned that he is not allowed to call him Joseph Jr. <laughs> and the worst news is that the baby isn't even his. <laughs> that kind of news could get Miriam killed in some communities and could certainly invalidate their marriage if he took her to court over it. The messenger tells Joseph that it's okay because the child is the son of God and that Joseph needs to stay with Miriam. Miriam decides to stay with her cousin Elizabeth and avoid her local congregation for a while to keep things on the down low. <laughs> Several months pass and the Passover is a big deal. And since King Josiah eliminated all the satellite altars in the nation a few centuries ago, Joseph and Miriam need to travel south to Jerusalem for their occasional pilgrimage even though Miriam is ready to pop. 
Joseph has a bunch of cousins in Bethlehem, so they figured they'd have a place to eat and sleep at the family estate, just a few hours' walk from the temple. Unfortunately, the cousins are not impressed that Miriam is pregnant before the wedding, and telling that it isn't Joseph's baby isn't the kind of thing that's going to make things better for Miriam. But they get lucky. They're not left out in the rain. There's animal shelter nearby. And all the shepherds have taken their flocks out into the countryside for that sweet spring grazing. While Miriam and Joseph are dealing with the labor that may have been accelerated by an 80-mile donkey ride, those shepherds are visited by a heavenly messenger who tells them that they need to get to Bethlehem and worship the newborn king. When they get there, a little, boy, a little baby boy named Joshua is calmly resting in his mother's arms, and the little fella grows up to change the world. <laughs> That's the Christmas story. Thanks, Preston. <laughs> yeah, it's... The idea that it was a trip for tax purposes, like we've addressed before, is just crazy. Miriam would have stayed home. Yep. <laughs> for sure. Uh, especially when the trip would have been terrible when you're pregnant. And there's no way that they didn't already consider the possibility that they wouldn't get to stay at the family estate anyway. Mm-hmm. And that's, the word in is almost universally applied to this story, that there's no room in the inn. Most most versions of the story say in. And it's weird that the word would better be translated as estate, a family estate, the place that the family had been living in probably for generations. It's not referring to a public house, but a private family dwelling. The Bible does tell us that shepherds were out in the fields with their flocks, like I said before, less common in cold, rainy weather. And whether there were any sorcerers vidi- visiting from the east do, is do, 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 do. <laughs> unfortunately impossible to know. Do, 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 do. <laughs> uh, since that part of the story used to illustrate um, the special nature of the Christ child isn't super historically reliable. But it is important for our next episode... Because we've got a fan request. Yes, we're going to be talking about the 12 days of Christmas, which have already enraged me a few times this December. Uh, I mean, it's it's too late now to stop the people from using it incorrectly as they have. But Next the... year. <laughs> Next year, there's going to be a mass correction because everyone will listen to our podcast. Everybody. <laughs> You're going to share it with your friends. We're going to have to. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. So Matthew also goes on to say that after um, King Herod found out about the baby, he had this mass slaughter planned for the area. And so Jesus and his family had to take off to Egypt. Uh, So far, this whole story seems very unlikely. Mm -hmm. The detail of the persecuted child trope. Matthew leaned into that pretty heavily. Um, The author suggested that this fleeing to Egypt and then back again would be a fulfillment of prophecy. And it's completely unnecessary. That's a weird interpretation of scripture because the prophecy that he's referring to isn't a prophecy at all, but a reference to Israel coming out of Egypt Mm. thousands of years before with the Exodus. This is kind of weird. (laughs) Christianity has a couple of traditions that just don't actually make sense. (laughs) Coming from a Christian. (laughs) That's why we keep you around, so I don't get in trouble. (laughs) And this whole story about Herod having all the young boys killed is also really not very likely. Um, Such a massacre was never mentioned by the contemporary historian Uh, Flavius Josephus, a lot of people call him Josephus, and I will hate that until the day I die. Wow. (laughs) Hmm? Wow. Yeah. It's just very passionate. (laughs) Josephus is not a... That pronunciation doesn't happen in Latin. (laughs) Mm, So Josephus. 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 Or Josephus, even more likely. Okay. Josephus is just kind of an anglicized deal. Fair. His name was Yosef Ben Matthew. 
good historian guy, very popular at the time, even though some of his texts have been fiddled around with by the Christians who kept publishing him. That's just the way it goes. But uh, good old Josephus pulled no punches when talking about what an evil douche nozzle Herod was, being a half-Jewish king that ended the line of the Maccabean dynasty that we talked about a couple of weeks ago with the Hanukkah story. So if even he didn't mention a perfectly good reason to hate this dude when he was willing to tell so many other stories of why you should hate this dude, it means that story might not have been real. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd think someone would record something so horrible. Right? Whether the story had the Magi led by the star to Nazareth or to Bethlehem, Bethlehem being a small suburb of Jerusalem, Nazareth being a very small town that was probably going by a different name up in the North Province. And so it's possible that they could have killed 30 kids and that never hit the news. But it just doesn't seem likely. But if you're really committed to the idea that the biblical story has to be history perfect, then this is what you bought into. We don't have any records outside the biblical text that testify of the town Nazareth before the 3rd century CE. Mm. So we do know that archaeologically, this the place that we now call Nazareth has basically always had a city there, or a town at least. But Some, some lean-tos, yeah. We've got archaeological evidence of solid structures yeah. that people lived in, a little bit better than lean-tos, <laughs> going way far back. But like before the 3rd century, would there have been anything there? Oh yeah, there was stuff just there, still. just... There's no record of it going by that name. Mm, I see what you're saying. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting. <laughs> the The Christians, when they started spreading out, they were distinguished from other Jews, not by the name Christian, but by the name Nazarenes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, as far as I know, that's how Christians are referred to in Arabic, is not Christian, but Nazarenes. Nazarenes. Interesting. So, yeah. So there's a strong tradition tied to this place that probably never even actually had that name designated to that town during the time the time that when mattered. that name was used. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of interesting stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I mean, you've kind of mentioned that you think Matthew is mostly fiction. So Matthew chapter 2. Matthew chapter 2. Pardon me. <laughs> The early childhood the stories of Jesus are a lot less reliable than his adulthood stories. So, like, my question is, and obviously this a little bit matters on your belief, but how much is true? Um, how much of this did they go back and write because he became important later in life? You know what I mean? I mean, like, nobody cares about it. your childhood until you've done something. All of the Gospels were written a while after well, Jesus true, had yeah. died. So... It's, that's just the way it goes. History didn't make him important until he was important. And then they're like, oh, now we need to ask people about what happened. Tell me more about Jesus. And then we get some stories that are less reliable. Oh, a little <laughs> sketchy. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating. <laughs> and, I and it definitely gives some pretty solid ground for atheists like yourself to stand on. <laughs> I mean, the one the one point I really, like, can't suspend my disbelief on is the virgin birth. I just really think Mary is the best liar of all time. Got away with it. Well done, girl. <laughs> it's interesting that there are scholars who have even decided that there's a name for the secret father of Jesus. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> and his name, according to these scholars, is Pantera, which is a oh. wicked sounding name. <laughs> yeah, isn't that a band? <laughs> it is. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> so it's loads of scholars for ages. Instead of saying there was no Jesus, or instead of saying, oh yeah, they just made up this story about his birth, they're like, no, she definitely had sex with somebody else and lied about it. Which, I mean, 
you've got an awful lot of options when you want to say the biblical text isn't true. Naming the guy Pantera is bold. <laughs> I mean, and like, I get it. It's like, I get how, because there's a lot of whatever mystical or fantastical things in the Bible. That's what makes it the Bible. That's what makes it spiritual and, and mm-hmm. divine. And I'm like, but it's never happened before. It never happened since. And again, I recognize that's like, the that's whole point of Jesus, special. right? <laughs> but I'm like, <laughs> you just, biologically, you can't do that. There must be some dude. Or even if it was Joseph, and they're just like, I'll keep in the hush hush. Virgin birth is an option today. By injecting a sperm. Right. Yeah. It's medically possible. Yeah. And. But you still need sperm. Right. So, adding a little miracle touch. I mean, that's. Starting to look even less special of a miracle. It's fair. <laughs> I think she and Joseph just got frisky and she was like, we have to lie about it. And he was like, okay, we will. Because <laughs> I like, don't want either of, of us to get with. stoned to death. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were some parts of the Jewish community where that would be a risk, but it's hard to say after the fact, separated by 2,000 years, whether or not their and then community. Easily 60 years when people are going back right. to write the story. It's 60 years is a long time. I don't think it was a full 60 years. When was the first gospel written? Uh, the first gospel was written probably less than 10 years oh, after okay. Jesus died. But the gospel of John is said to have been, been written about 60 years yeah. after he died. Yeah. So. We've got time for people to figure out these stories, screw up some stories. Like I said, 60 years, especially then when people didn't live as long, right? Like, I'm just 30, right? So for me to write about someone that died 60 years or sixty years ago, yeah, that's 30 years before I was even born. <laughs> yes, that is the case. However... I'm just doing math. <laughs> I'm doing complicated math on this podcast, guys. So... John the Revelator, or John the Apostle, or John the Evangelist, whoever wrote the gospel according to John, would have been a very, very old man. He was pretty surely younger than Jesus by a few years. Hard to say how much. He may have been older. That seems unlikely. But that would have put him still close to 90 when he wrote it. Which is almost unheard of 2,000 years ago. Yeah, it was weird for people to live It's even weird now. Like, our life expectancy now is 82, I think, in Canada. Yeah. So. Um, Contrary to popular belief, the average life expectancy of the human race has never actually been 30. (laughs) We had a lot of infant mortality, historically speaking, until very recently. Oh, so that brings down the average. And that brings down your average average terribly. I was actually just thinking about that when <laughs> before you even said it. I was like, yeah, but there's so many people who die young mm-hmm. that even if the most people in Canada live till 90, there's enough people who die young to bring it down. Whatever that eat young is, whether that's a kid or a 30-year-old or a 40-year-old. Yeah. Anyway. So it's always been normal to at least make it into your 60s if you made it to puberty. Unless you, of course, you were actively engaged in Warfare sword or something, combat, yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Um, what are your final thoughts on this Christmas story? Well, Luke did try really hard to compile good information from a wide variety of sources. And either he or some later editor clearly made some mistakes, especially about the taxes <laughs> and the census. And definitely some other time-sensitive historical details, some benchmarks on when things happened, probably. It's very real possibility. But unfortunately, the entirety of Matthew chapter 2, I have to dismiss as fiction. It's a great story, but it's the dangerous kind of fiction that leads scholars, priests, and laymen alike into making misleading assumptions that undermine the integrity of the whole narrative and that's frustrating yeah but it's all about directing people's attention to jesus and appreciating him even more than normal for one special day even if it's several months removed from an appropriate time (laughs) right you can follow us 
on, on Instagram. On Facebook. On Discord. On YouTube. Oh, on YouTube. Yeah. Discord. Uh, check out our Patreon and our Spreadshirt. We're putting up new co- Patreon content. We put up a fun little radio show called Miami Christ the other day. <laughs> we have some, so much fun recording that. We have some interviews planned for the new year that will not be public release and only for our patrons. So check us out on there. And then we have a fabulous, another fabulous contest sponsored by Blackbird Farm and Apothecary. They've been very generous with helping us out a little bit, and we want to return the favor. (laughs) We're running another contest. This time we are giving away a Peace Be With You cutting board, and it's going to be a little different. Last time we got you to like and share on social media, but we're pushing our Discord this time. So So we want you to get on board Discord, and you'll see the rules for the giveaway there. All you have to do is... Take a picture, show us that you're following Blackbird Apothecary and Farm on either Facebook or Instagram and post it in our Discord tenter. Blackbird Farm and Apothecary. Blackbird Farm and Apothecary <laughs> on Facebook or Instagram and post it in our Discord to enter. And the, what's the prize? I already said, a piece be with you cutting board. We gotta emphasize that. A piece be with you cutting board. <laughs> Cut your meat on our fingers. <laughs> Was that a good ad? I love it. (laughs) Thank you so much. Winner will be announced on Discord on January 7th. Yeah, so be sure to check out our friends at Blackbird Farm and Apothecary on Facebook and Instagram. Peace Peace be be with with you. you. By the late Middle Ages, the Christian prophecy had fulfilled itself.